In this lecture, we're going to cover a, a topic of mine, which I'm uh, particularly interested in, uh, is uh, a recording technique, which is used commonly in, in archaeological uh, excavation and practice. But I feel it's been very much underutilized, particularly in, in archiving, uh, reproduction for reports, and also in publications. Um, so in this lecture, we are going to discuss the significance of profile or section recording. We're going to take a look at techniques of recording profiles. We're going to look at profiles and sampling, dating. We're going to look at profile sampling microfossils and profile sampling sediment like micromorphology. I'm not going into dating microfossils and sediment micromorphology themselves, the, um, the rec how, the, how the analysis what they necessarily mean independently. It's just about how we record them in, um, in uh, profiles and profile recording and how they can be illustrated in reports and publications. I'm gonna go into profile production for reports and publications. And I've got some final comments to um, discuss at the end. So profiles. Profiles can and are produced throughout archaeological excavation um, and they can used to record various different types of features, usually in the vertical orientation. Okay? So on the left hand side here, we've got a ditch. This looks like somewhere in the UK at yeah, Hungerford. Um, this is a nice uh, sediment filled ditch cut through chalk. So you can see very clearly the different deposits here. If you look at my cursor, you can see the various different deposits within in the ditch fill and it shows and is illustrated very nicely in the photograph here with ranging rods and um, uh, information board there. Uh, so you can see this half section posts and pits are the same thing and as you can see through this section three ditches. A building and structure recording here on the right hand side you can see this uh, person at the bottom here uh, recording the walls of these um, of this uh, structure. These are actually known as elevation or elevation drawings and you can re record um, the main features of each of those walls and some of the important features like how the of the walls have been modified and the wall and and altered for example you can see where my cursor here is you can see some brickwork in the wall there where a, a window or something's been infilled at a later date all this provides us really useful information on um shall we say shape and and morphology of, of features and pits and ditches and gullies um, and also the construction techniques and modifications that are being used in, in buildings um, and structures. So, you know, we, we might want to know how ditches were dug and infilled, how structures were built and then modified. These are all important pieces of information that we can extract from profiles and profile and, and elevation drawings. These um, can occur during excavation predominantly do occur during excavation. The elevation drawings can occur at the end of excavations as well. What I'm going to talk about now is something a little bit more specific. Um, so the focus in this discussion is going to be on what we call excavation profiles or elevations and their recording. Um, these, in this case, are the sides of trenches once excavation has been completed or quite commonly completed. Um, these can be open air excavations or cave excavations. As I say, most occur when excavations occur. They're known either as sections or profiles, sometimes recording as excavations proceed. So for example, on the right hand side there, this is from the very famous Liang Bua cave site. This is 10 meters deep. They had to um, shore this. So they had to put uh, boards up against the, the sides of the trench. Um, no doubt they recorded partially recorded at different times. 
So they wouldn't have recorded it all in one go. They would have recorded the walls of the trenches at different times, the profiles at different times, and then built up the whole image of the profile afterwards. You can see this looks rather three-dimensional, where you've got two different walls of the trenches, two different sides of the trenches, and made it look three-dimensional. Uh, so that's, um, so that's uh, quite useful. Uh, or they can be recorded towards the end of the excavations when dig digging has been completed. This is commonly in our excavation trenches, when once you've completed the excavation, you can clean up the walls of the trenches, you can, rec you can uh, photograph them, and you can draw and record them. Okay. So what's the importance of, of profiles and profiles drawing? Well, basically profiles provide a considerable amount of inf significant information. Right? They are, they're a visual representation of the stratigraphic and temporal sequences. So we can see here in the profile here, this is from a site called Logak in, uh, in southern Vietnam. You can see where the arrow's pointing here, you can very clearly see the different stratigraphic layers of deposits. Right? It's extremely complex but there they are. And you can see the stratigraphic and temporal sequences. So the orange layer here, numbered here, is on top of this light gray layer, which is on top of the thin black layer, which is on top of a darker gray layer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you can see the spatial distributions around the excavation as well. So you can follow these layers around the size of the excavation and see their spatial distributions in the two dimensions of the profile walls. What you can also see is intrusive features and disturbances that have impacted on the device. Here's a huge pit that was actually dug through this feature, through this, uh, these deposits here. We've excavated it in the trench, but you can see very clearly in the profile the extent and size of that, um, of that feature in the profile. And you can record it very neatly, truncating through all the underlying deposits here, all the way down to this level down here. So profiles possess much more information than any single plan recorded on a site. So you've got your recordings of your plans, you've got your recordings of your individual profiles. They, each of those individual plans and profiles will record really essential information that you've recorded during the excavation, but they do not contain the, the, the amount of information that you will get from a good recording of a profile of this type. So with a clear understanding of strategically that profiles provide, it's possible to sample from and record additional data onto profiles. Here is a, here's a, this illustration here is a drawn up profile. Um, and you can see the types of information that can actually be incorporated onto a profile. So profiles effectively act as records of multiple lines of archaeological research, information and interpretation. And just briefly, you can see that in this profile here. So beyond the fact that we've just got um, the drawings themselves with the individual layers, here you can see the different contact context numbers that we've provided here. We've also got phytolith samples. We've got the Cubiana tins or the geomorph samples here. We've got the, the um, chronometric dating provided and even the phasing provided there, along with the, with the usual information we put there. So we're gonna work back through this a little bit and I'll demonstrate how something like this is produced from the excavation, the end of excavation, the recording through to the reproduction. Now, something to remember that's really important at the end of, it, at the end of an excavation, you are left with your profiles, right? The profiles need recording and sampling. This is a time consuming process. And if you've got a big excavation trench with very complicated deposits, as you can see here, this is Lok Gak again in Southern Vietnam, um, with lots of context, you can see it takes, or it takes a long time. Make sure you give yourself that time at the end of the excavations to do this, because the profile recording and the sampling out of the profiles can be extremely important. You can get your dating samples, your phytolith samples, your geomorph samples out of the profiles. You need to record them, you need to photograph them, you need to record them, okay? So the process is also often sequential, where you have general profile photography first, illustrating and drawing before you can take your samples out. You need your drawings finished, 
and your photography finished before you start taking your samples out. You can't locate your samples until you've actually done your drawing. Okay? You could potentially take the samples out first before you do the drawing. The issue there is then you've got to come on that back and then record the samples and the sample bags again and make sure you've got the right numbers and everything on there. Whereas if you do your recording first, then the person who's done the recording can stand there with a planning board and say, right, okay, the samples come from there. Your context number is X, Y, and Z, right? And it's all done and recorded. Accurate recording is a central first step in the archive of profile information, right? And it should be an essential part of your archive, archiving full stop. So your trench is at the trench here on the left hand side. This is a site called Lok Giang, which is in southern Vietnam here. And on the right hand side is a site called Ru Diep, which is in central, north central Vietnam. You can see they've both been excavated down to, down to the natural underneath. Um, and they've all been recorded and they've got their context numbers in, uh, most of their context numbers in their profiles there. Right? Um, now what you need to do, you've got, you've got to clean up those profiles and you've got to record them. As you can see, as we've excavated down through the deposits, we've actually stuck the context numbers into the walls of the trench. The reason we've done that is because it makes it nice and easy to understand what you've actually excavated and what those numbers of those deposits are. What you need to do is you can photograph the uh, profiles with the numbers in, okay, as is shown here. Two ways to do this, right? You can simply use it as a recording which is the left hand side here you see there's no scales or other information in there this photograph is simply a photograph of the profile to start with that's got all the numbers in place so that you can then zoom in and you can see which layer is numbered with what number okay uh, on the right hand side we've organized the context numbers down through here the deposits made it all nice added in the scales um, and this could be used as a, as a record shot, um, as something that would go into a report, for example. So it's all nice and neat and tidy, okay? So there's, there's some of the information in the drawing. On the left-hand side, or here, you can see that the numbers have actually been removed from the uh, profiles. Um, the scales have been added. The uh, information board has been added here and the profiles and the base of the trench is really nice and clean and ready for photography. So we can photograph that profile, it's nice and clean and tidy. Um, and you, you can see that we've made sure that we can get the whole profile into the photograph um, and there it is with the scale drawings. On the right hand side here, we've um, actually done the uh, major full scale profile drawing and then we've done some doing some close up illustrations as well you can see that you know we're only doing part of this part of the profile here um, these make really good record images or if you want to in the future demonstrate certain features within within that part of the profile you've got those nice close up photographs to illustrate that right remember that you don't always know exactly what you're going to want to record or what you're going to want to reproduce in the future. There may be features or information within a profile that is not, that is significant, but the initial significance does not become apparent when you first actually record the profiles, right? So it's best to do as much recording as you possibly can. It's a shame to come to your post excavation research and find, oh my goodness, I should have actually photographed this part of the profile more closely, more accurately, because there's this X information in the profile that I didn't think would be relevant. Right? So recording is really, really important. Um, you can also use, use targets to link consecutive profiles. So if you wanted to, the profile on the right, if you wanted to put, I don't know, two red and, red and white targets in the profile there, on the right hand side, part way down the profile, where the cursor is here, you could do that. And then you can move your scales along 
to where those, those, those cursors are or to the other end of what's going to be the next photograph. And you can actually match those up and reconstruct the profile. Right? So that's possible to do too. So you get a very close up accurate imagery of the profiles. So if your context layer feature numbers have been removed for the photography, you may well need to replace them. So your initial photograph or record photograph to start with with your numbers in, it's going to become very important right? because you're going to have to replace the numbers. Probably the better idea is to actually to record the profiles first. Right? You could clean them with the numbers in and photograph them, as you saw, report publications with the, with the numbers in, draw them, then clean up the, the base of the trench again and take the numbers out and re-record, right? So there's, there's various, there's no absolute right way to do it. Certain circumstances, you do it one way, other circumstances, you might do it a different way, yeah? You can see on the right-hand side here, this is an image from, um, from the site of Taklak with um, recording in progress here. You can see all the context numbers all um, mostly vertically placed here for the layers. And then these other numbers are for these independent features that are being recorded here in the, in, that are in the middle of the profile. And so the numbers can't be moved to the end, okay? Um, you need for uh, profile drawing, you need to establish a sensible baseline. That's the nails here at each end of the trench with a string line going across. The string line needs to be level, and that's called your baseline. And then you can measure your deposits and features and the bottom and top of the trench from this line, okay? The yellow here is a tape that's being used here, which is your horizontal measurement tape. Note how that hangs down slightly. You don't measure from the tape, you measure from the string, and you pull the tape, tape tight to get the length measurement. And then you use a hand tape to measure vertically up and down. The, the baseline should be horizontal. Profiles are drawn, generally drawn at a scale of one to 10, unless someone tells you otherwise. So here we have a, a drawing of a profile. This is from Lok Gak again in Southern Vietnam. First and foremost, the profile should be an accurate scale record of features and deposits, right? Always, best to make the profile understandable. So basically here we are, we've got the profile here, I've put my baseline across, and then we've drawn the various deposits onto the profile, okay? So this is the end result here. Included in the profile here, so this is a basic measurement measured drawing here. You should also include is the title here at the top, right? What are you actually drawn? Right, so west wall of trench one. We've got the context numbers added onto the drawing. Very important, you know, need to know which layer belongs to which um, and what the relationships are in between layers and deposits. You've got a scale at the top here, right? Scale one to 10. Uh, you've got the orientation of the profile. So what's the difference between the title here, calling it the west wall, and calling it east facing. Well, some practitioners will use uh, the wall of which the wall of the trench as the overriding um, uh, orientation factor. So this is actually the west wall of the trench, but it's the west wall, the profile itself actually. So when you look at the profile, you're facing west. The profile itself is facing east. I, I was taught to use this, the direction the profile was facing in. Others are told to just use which wall of the profile it actually is. It doesn't really matter. I prefer to put both so it avoids confusion. The date it was illustrated, who illustrated it, and you need other things like you'll need your height of your datum. And don't forget, you need to mark on your datum line as well. You know, this is the two points, the nails where the string was actually attached. <coughs> this one says minus one meter from TBM. TBM means temporary benchmark. The te we know the actual temp height above sea level for the temporary benchmark. All I've recorded here 
for the purposes of the initial drawing is actually that it's a meter below the temporary benchmark. When I come to do the archiving and drawing up, I may well then add this as the actual above sea level level rather than just above the temporary, temp temporary benchmark level. I'll come back to the other information in a bit. A key is always handy, but understanding to understand your artwork and inclusions, right? So you can see in this illustration here, we've got numerous different types of inclusion marked on the profile here, right? So we want to record what they are. So we've got a key up here. We've got oyster, these little flat lines. Pottery are these dark lines here. You can see and the cursor is here. Um, you've got these little curvy lines for your Anadara shells, which is a different type of shell to the, um, to the oyster. Then we've got stones, a clear, um, like this one down here, right? And we've got little lumps of burnt clay as well. Those are the main inclusions within the illustration here. Artwork done well can make the profile illustration look aesthetic, but importantly, it makes it easier to understand. So in the illustration here, for example, it's very clear which deposits have lots of shell in them and which deposits don't have lots of shell, of shell in them. If this was just drawn as horizontal lines and empty with numbers, it would lose some of that visualization. You wouldn't be able to see what is actually being articulated within the report or the publication, right? It won't be there, right? It'll just be lines on a profile drawing, all right? Important. And the other thing is you can see the features here. These are post holes and little pits and things that have been excavated through as well. Important, got their own numbers as well. So, that's how we how we draw it up first of all but then you can do your sampling from the profile right and you can add in those samples onto your drawings right so once the once the illustrations have been completed you can go and look in the profiles and go right ah yeah there's a piece of charcoal i'm going to sample that piece of charcoal and you can record those charcoal samples here you can see the charcoal samples. Now, charcoal samples get 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 um, get sampled throughout the excavation as well. So these are often additional samples here. So you can see this is actually from our excavations at Tatlak in, in north central Vietnam. You can see actually the they've got SA numbers of 280, 278, 277. These are, these are the these are very specific numbers for charcoal samples that we've sampled from this excavation. Uh, and they've got the specific code SA. So you can see these are samples number 277, 278, and 280, okay? So a 280th sample. But they've all got their independent individual numbers, which is useful for, um, for recording throughout. It's also useful when, when you come and do your um, work with the radiocarbon laboratories and find that all your samples have got individual numbers. Makes it very much more helpful for the radiocarbon lab and yourself to understand where those samples have actually come from. But what's specific about samples taken out of the profile is that um, the advantage is you can ex illustrate exactly where they have been recovered. Right? So you can see these three samples very clearly come from context 102. There they are. And if you date those samples, you can actually then say, well, this sample, this sample SA280 has this for a very specific date. And that can be actually illustrated on the profile drawing. Okay. So charcoal samples can be illustrated on drawings. Um, you can also illustrate your optical stimulated luminescence drawings. This is very common to be done. Um, the first illustration at the top here, I'm going to take a little bit of a diversion here for a second, because this is kind of interesting. So they, they've actually marked on hypothetical um, uh, uh, luminescence dating locations. Um, so the, the uh, what they've, what they've done here also is they've actually cleverly illustrated what they're, um, what they're actually likely to be dating, right? So this is a ditch that's been dug through. You can see the edges of the ditch here very clearly, right? So this is a ditch excavated through 
Um, and these here, they say time of early infilling event. So you can see this dark layer here, demarcated by this line here. So that will give you the dates for the earliest deposits. Time of later infilling of the event here, this is this light deposit in here. This one is later than the deposit under, must be, it's on top, right? Then you've got time, what they call time of burial here. These ones, this is another, the third deposit in on top. And then you've got time of burial and soil development on top. This post dates this feature altogether. You can see this goes right across here. So post dates the feature altogether, okay? So each of these uh, thermoluminescence or luminescence dates, we are stimulated optical dates would be dating different deposits here. Now, this is excavated through a natural soil here, or deposit here. So this will be maximum age estimate, okay? So you get your maximum age estimate here. The question is, do any of these dates actually date the excavation of this, this ditch or trench? No, they don't. So whether you get the maximum age, you, it will be somewhere between the maximum age here and the infilling here, okay? That's a bit of a sideline, but the importance here is that they've indicated on where the different samples were taken. The same as, same as the, um, the, um, the uh, illustration underneath here. You can see, you can mark all these onto your profile drawing if you wanted, even where the dosometer is here, you could do that. Um, and they've also marked on, importantly, where their micromorphology sediment sample was actually taken from as well, okay? So this, uh, this provides a useful indication of the relationship between the OSO samples and where their micromorphology samples are. And as they've done in their publication, you can reproduce that and reproduce that illustration here in the photograph rather than the drawing, but you can reproduce that, right, to provide that really important information. Pollen and phytolith samples. Well, pollen and phytolith samples are excellent for reconstruction of the vegetation present on and around the site. So taking these samples can be really significant. And it's important that we try and take these samples throughout the archeological sequence that we've actually excavated. Um, it can, they can include economic plants as well as such as rice and bananas, as well as some of the more natural vegetation that might actually be crawling around the site. So phytoliths and pollen are really important. So we wanna sample them and sample this, take the samples out. Um, this is an illustration here of sampling at a site called Rudiep in North Central Vietnam. Uh, you can see all the, all the different deposits here, all labeled and marked here. We've got the profile drawing probably over here, um, and I'm, we're recording the individual um, uh, pollen and phytolith samples, uh, taking a sample out with a trowel and placing them in, in, in a small bag and then we'll mark those with independent individual numbers as well. So sediment samples, loose sediments removed from profile, are placed in a Ziploc bag. Um, and those samples then are recorded on the profile. So the illustration here at the bottom, you can see where I've actually, this, this illustration is actually Rudy F as well. You can see where we've actually indicated those phytolith samples have actually come from and indicated the phytolith sample uh, which what sample it is, and the sequence of numbers, as you can see, is different to those for, for, um, for things like charcoal. They have their own independent sequence of numbers for phytolith stroke pollen, okay? So you can see phyto 88A. What that means is we've taken two samples from the same location. So we've split the samples to send off to two different specialists, all right? And what's important, they're marked on the profile here. Okay, so we can see exactly where they came from, their locations. Uh, Geomorph sediment micromorphology samples. Now sediment micromorphology, this is a way of taking blocks of sediment out of the profiles. Now the blocks of sediment are actually taken out whole. The idea, um, they can provide invaluable data on depositional and post-depositional processes. We want to know how these sediments have developed, yeah? And what information they can provide about human activity on the site. Now, 
they can be extremely important and provide you with fantastic information about the processes of post depositional processes of accumulation that have actually occurred on the site. Okay. Um, they can also identify human activity on the site at the micro scale. So in situ fireplaces, in situ depositional features, you know, like uh, maybe someone's deposited some uh, rice, they can find the rice fighter lifts, whatever, whatever, whatever that, that you're looking for within, 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 within the deposit accumulations. Okay. So the blocks of sediment are taken out wholesale. So you can see this is down at the, the final stages down at Tak Lak um, in North Central Vietnam. And you can see the blocks of sediment are actually being removed and they're then covered in plaster of Paris um, and, and boxed up and all their numbers and all their recording and everything is placed on the plaster of Paris, Paris before they're bagged up. What you can also notice is where we've actually taken the samples out, there's plaster of Paris everywhere, there's sediment everywhere. It's a mess, right? This is the last thing you do because it's really very, very messy, okay? And it completely destroys your profiles. Um, but it's important, it can take a considerable amount of time to actually take these samples, it's not easy. Okay? And you will get often get some failures as well and have to restart again. So at TACLAC, this took us more than a day to do these samples, to get these samples out. Um, but for our research and interpretation, they have been oh so significant. They've been very, very important. And the time consumed taking these samples was well, well worth it. Okay, so sampling for these final stages. So it follows the phytolith and pollen sampling, follows everything else you want to do. They can, they're messy, but more importantly as well, as they can cause contamination. And you don't want the contamination in things like your phytolith, pollen, any other sampling that you're actually going to do on the site. As I say, monolith tins inevitably destroy the walls of the trench, as you can see here. They make huge, great holes in them. It's all over at this stage. Huh? So they're recorded with their own sequence of numbers. So, and for example, SM1, soil micromorphology sample one. On the left-hand side here, um, you can see that we've actually located the monolith samples, okay? Um, and with their sample numbers, and you can see where they actually potentially intersect different deposits. Because the micromorphologist really wants to know what the relationships are between these different deposits. And that gives them a better idea of how this sequence has developed and what hasn't, hasn't happened in, in, um, since, since deposition, okay? So locating monophilists on point are very important and they're di di directly relate to the sedimentary sequence. Okay, so the the micromorphologist can then relate back to those in those the profile drawings and see exactly what deposits they'd actually excavated through. They'll have the information as well on that on the on the on the samples themselves, but they'll visually be able to see the relationship then between all these individual samples as well, which is also really important. Then if you've got a good stratigraphic profile recording, it also permits the specialists to do some really funky things. This is El Grono, who you just saw in the last images. Um, we're just producing this for publication now, but you can see all the really interesting information that has been placed onto the illustration. So on the right-hand side here, I've got the actual profile itself. Yeah, this is the profile the information came from. The red box here is basically the illustration here of stratigraphy on the left hand side that's recording that part there then l the, here's the context numbers down the right hand side here okay that's all the recorded context numbers l can refer back to the profile drawings for that right and see what each of these context numbers are um, and then she on the left hand side here she's got the dates for each of these layers um, and then the interpretation of recording here on the right hand side. This is Elle's thin sections that she's made out of the micromorph samples. I'm not going to go into the detail on that. You can do a whole lecture on micromorphology sampling and thin sections, etc. The important factor here for us is, is the fact that L was able, or the micromorphologist is able, to relate those samples directly back to the profiles and the profile drawings that the samples were taken from. Right? Really important. And then you can do all this really nice um, 
fantastic illustrations and imagery with all this really important information on and that can go into its own independent publications okay the importance of the profiles so profile uh, production for reports and publications so once is once you put all the data onto your profile all the data you think you're going to need on your profile you can rep reproduce it by using drawing software yeah i use adobe illustrator um, it's time consuming um, i love my punk music and i just stick music on and i just go for it my, and i find it absolutely therapeutic um, this is where the detail becomes really important um, if this is not included on the original it cannot re be re reproduced in the artwork okay? so you can see the detail in the original illustration here in the first place we're then able to reproduce that right? um, in, in, the, in the art form that we're going to reproduce with, the, with, the, um, with the Adobe Illustrator. So voila, you turn your uh, original site drawing into something along the lines of this. Right? Um, if, if your uh, software includes layers, layer options, then you can separate out data and choose to include it or not. So you can see here on the right hand side with Adobe Illustrator, I've used different layers to include different pieces of information. So like the contexts are on one, the inclusions on one, the layers are on one, and the Cubiana tins, that's these for the micromorph samples are on a separate layer. So I can choose to use the micromorph tin illustrations or not. The same with the fighter list. I can take them on or off the illustration, okay? So that's really, that's can be quite important. Do I want a, this illustration to have the Cubiana tins on it? Maybe not. So you just um, switch that layer off and therefore they're not there, okay? And you can do that with all the different types of information that you put on there, okay? Um, so you put the, put the information on. There's no title on here because it'll be a report or publication and therefore that will go into the caption underneath. You can also include the dates. So you can see we've used, included the calibrated dates here as well within the layers that they, those dates actually came from. You can then do funky things like this. You can then actually put your profiles, the illustration above your profile drawings. Right? The photographic illustration shows some really interesting, important information, but you can demonstrate how that then relates to the different contexts and context numbers that you've recorded. Right? You can also illustrate where exactly the cubianotins were, where exactly the phytolith samples came from, where exactly the, the charcoal samples came from, and that relates them back to about the photographic image as well. And you go, oh yeah, okay, I can see where all that comes from. Um, and then you can reproduce your key as well. Up, uh, and the, in this case, it's up in the top left hand corner there with all the information there again. Um, the key can then be tailored to the information on the profile. So you can, as I say, you can take things on and off the profile. The key can then be tailored to actually the profile itself and the profile illustration that you may be using for that type of report or publication. So once repair, prepared for reports and archiving, profiles can be included in publication. So here's a publication from um, the, what we did recently from a site called Lok Jiang. Um, and you can see we've done exactly the same thing again. The profile is on top of the, of the, of the um, photograph, but you can see exactly the same thing. And you can see in this one, we've actually included, also included the, our interpretation of the faces of the site along with the radiocarbon dates here, a key. We, in this one, we've decided to actually use the title as well. Uh, scale is important, of course, it needs to go in on time. So there's the information provided and reproduced. And it's very clear, it's, it, you can see very clearly what's actually been discussed within the publication, yeah. Um, the information on your profiles should actually correspond to the methods and results described in the text. Okay, so we've included the micromorph there discussed, in, dis discussed and here um, our samples are labeled A1, A2. It's the same thing. It doesn't matter as long as they've got their own independent numbers. So we've included the orientation, we've included the scale, we've included the key, the context numbers, the fighter lists, the dating, 
the soil micromorphology, the datum, and here you've, we've, we've converted it here, you can see to above sea level. We've included the phasing. So all that information is actually there. So final remarks, profiles recorded well, provide an excellent visual record of the stratigraphy on a site. Information on chronological sequencing, we can see the chronologies there and the different deposits, different phases perhaps of site occupation. Um, you can also, as you see, as I said, we've added the uh, radiocarbon dates here as well. So you can see that there's significance of the dating as well. Um, it's an excellent method to present a range of important information beyond stratigraphy. So you can include your samples on, the, on your profile drawings as well as we've, we've just discussed and talked about through here. Any information that you think significant or you want to re reproduce in reports and publications can be reproduced easily for reports and publications to support your interpretation and present data clearly and concisely. And that's what's important here. You can see from these profiles, profiles done well provide considerable amount of information. You know, the drawings are probably better than several thousand words because you can see those illustrations very clearly. Um, and the sequencing and the chronology and the features that were excavated. And in this case as well, disturbance, you know, in the top of the top of the excavation as well. So it's all there. Okay, that concludes this, um, this lecture. Thank you very much for listening.